Hello, I'm Margaret McMillan. Without the ability to persuade others, a leader is not going to be able to lead, and he's not going to be able, or she's not going to be able to get what it is he or she wants. Chapter two, persuasion, or bending others to your will. If you look at someone like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, for example, or our own Mackenzie King, where they were extremely good was keeping enough people on side. They, they knew they couldn't persuade everyone, but they had enough people coming with them. They didn't go beyond what their people would tolerate, but they moved them gradually, bit by bit by bit, very carefully. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the American president for an unprecedented four terms. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days. If you want to understand just how persuasive Roosevelt could be, get one of his fireside chats. My countrymen and my friends. Roosevelt had a capacity to talk directly to the American people, and he used radio very effectively. And so, although Americans saw their political leaders, they were often remote figures. And what the fireside chat did is bring the voice of the American president into your living room. And so you'd be sitting there with your family, just two or three of you, and here was this man apparently talking directly to you. I want to talk with you about a number of subjects that directly affect the future of the United States. He wasn't making a speech. He would say, hello, you know, how are you doing? You know, you felt that he was talking to you, not to millions of other people. I think it is right on this Sabbath evening that I should say a word in behalf of women and children and old men who need help immediate help in that present distress. Roosevelt was facing a big political problem with Congress. France had been defeated in the summer of 1940, and, and the British were running very short of resources. They had been buying from the United States, but they were now running out of money. And so what Roosevelt had to try and persuade the American people that it was in their best interest to lend the British the things they needed to defend themselves. And so Roosevelt said, look, your neighbor's house is on fire. And he comes to you and he says, I need a hose. Will you lend me your hose? Well, Roosevelt said, of course you would. And you're not going to say to your neighbor, I'm not going to lend you my hose unless you pay cash on the, on the barrel right now, because the important thing is to get the fire out. And actually, if he doesn't get his fire out, my house could catch on fire as well. You know, that was such a brilliant way of explaining why it was important for Britain to get the war material it needed, why it couldn't pay, but why eventually it was going to benefit the United States. And so what had been perhaps a rather superficial charm, a kind of charm that would you know, be very good at social events, now became a tool that he used to win over support. Mackenzie King, I think, is undervalued in Canadian history. What I think we miss about Mackenzie King is just how successful he was. He was and is Canada's longest serving prime minister. He was extremely good at keeping the country together. He, and if you look at his correspondence, he was constantly writing letters. He would remember people's birthdays. He kept in touch with people right across the country. And he kept people on side. Um, not everyone found him charming. Uh, the wife of one of the British um, diplomats in Ottawa said, whenever I meet him, he overdoes it. And he, she said, I feel like I've been licked all over by a cat. So not everyone liked Mackenzie King, but many people found him charming. He had good friends. He could be very amusing. Apparently, he was a very good ballroom dancer. Possibly the greatest crisis William Lyon Mackenzie King faced was the conscription crisis in the Second World War. Conscription was a very sensitive issue in Canada, partly because of what had happened in the First World War, when there had been a division in the country between the English speakers and the French speakers over the issue of conscription. By 1943, the number of volunteers had become a trickle, and the army was saying that we really need more men. We've got to have more men. We've got to have conscription. And Mackenzie King was very reluctant to do it and had made this famous statement where he said, conscription if necessary, but not necessarily conscription. In a compromise to meet necessary overseas army needs, the prime minister at Ottawa yields on the conscription. And what he did eventually was bring in a conscription bill with support in Quebec, which said that young men would be conscripted. Initially, they would only serve in Canada, but this would free up other soldiers and, and sailors to go abroad. And so he managed to move Canada in the direction of conscription in the Second World War without splitting the country. And I think that's one of his greatest achievements. <laughs> 
if I'm thinking about the characteristic of persuasion among world leaders today, I think there are a number who you can say have that. I think President Obama has a great gift of persuasion. He's in a, he has a tremendous eloquence. I have no more campaigns to run. Of course, what he's trying to do is persuade the unpersuadable in Congress. I know, because I won both of them. Um. You have Angela Merkel, who's not nearly as eloquent as Obama, but has managed to instill in the German people a sense that she will tell them the truth, that she's upfront with them, that she will do her best for them, and she has managed to bring them along. And I think you see her recently using her political capital on the refugee crisis. But I think she's managed through her career to inspire a confidence which has served her very well. Thanks for watching. To view the next video in the Art of Leading series, just click here. Go on, it's good stuff. Pat Nixon, who was advised not to wear red, because red traditionally in China had been the color that prostitutes wore.